this evening, uh, how does Genesis 3 impact uh, our understanding of what God thinks of astrology and the zodiac and occultic practices, gamings, especially any gaming that has to do with uh, killing uh, with occultic uh, type of overtones, monsters, uh, especially with names that come out of the Bible, uh, you know, like Apollyon and, and uh, you know, the Destroyer and things like that. Uh, movies, uh, especially all the different ones that come out about finding boxes that have spirits inside of them and all kinds of stuff like that. Eastern religions, uh, yoga, which by the way, 15 million Americans are yogis uh, and it's growing all the time. Uh, and uh, Reiki, which is that uh, energy healing uh, art. How does God want us to respond to Satan's influences in our daily world? So that's the question. I guess uh, the answer, um, you know, people like the short of it. So what do I think of all of those items from right there down? All of them are experiencing Satan's influence. And, but not just them. And I think we need to understand and think uh, through the, the grid that God has given us. And so what we're going to do this evening is, uh, first of all, look at, and if you want to turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians 2, I uh, just want to show you a, a kind of a pointed uh, warning that the Apostle Paul gave to the Philippians. Remember, he gave this to them probably 55 uh, 56, somewhere in there, he's writing this about the same time as Romans. And that's right in the same time period as the book of Acts. So right what we're studying in the morning, this is what he's talking about to the Corinthians. But he says in verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, we have a habit as humans. It's kind of like if you ignore it, you hope it goes away. And, and we do that with a lot of things, you know. We do that with, uh, you know, things that, that bother us, you know, a pesky bug or, or with a sound in our car or with a little pain here and there. Basically, we've been taught all of our life, if you ignore it, it'll most likely go away. And, and so that kind of carries over sometimes into our spiritual lives. And what Paul is saying here is, don't ignore the devil because he won't go away. And he's talking to us about Satan's devices. And when we ignore problems with our health and our homes and our cars, those problems usually worsen. And people that bother us that we ignore and hope they go away, it works sometimes, but often it doesn't. But it never works with the devil. And so when we enter into the realm of our spiritual life, ignoring the devil is the worst choice we can make. So if Satan is influencing and impacting and permeating parts of our world around us, and we just ignore it, and say, we hope it goes away. It, it is dangerous. Paul warns the church. If you look here, he's talking to the Corinthians. It's his second epistle. And he says, more than any other New Testament writer, Paul says there is danger in the devil. Now, Peter mentions the devil, you know, in, in 1 Peter 5. And, and James mentions the devil, too. But Paul seems to put warnings about Satan all throughout all of his epistles. He is very much in the forefront. And if we could summarize everything in Paul's extensive teachings on Satan, it would be what it says right here in verse 11. Don't, don't allow the devil to be there without us in a defensive position, being ready and wary, because our adversary is the devil. And he's always wanting to devour us, especially if we ignore him. And basically what we need to do is hold up all of our habits, all of our desires, all of our hobbies, our spare time, our recreation, our sports, our pursuits, our collections, our appetites, and everything else to the scrutiny of God's word. And the reason I say that is that there are sometimes things that appear harmless that aren't. So I'll just read to you. I brought it. This is a little tiny note from uh, a message that uh, John Piper uh, if you've heard of John Piper, a pastor in Minneapolis area, in fact, Rod used to be in his church, weren't you, for years, our chairman of our elders, uh, when, when he lived and worked in Minneapolis. But I mean, this guy is a pastor, and, and he was doing a series called Finally Alive, and now it's in print. And this is just, I just clipped out 
two paragraphs of, of what he said to his church. He said, Oh, how jealous I am that the followers of Jesus be Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated, discerning people. I mean, as soon as I say that, you know it's Piper talking. That's how he talks. Now he says this. For example, I pray that you don't just sign up at your local yoga class and not know what you're doing. Yoga is to the body what a mantra is to the mouth. The two are rooted in the same worldview. Take my own town as an example. When I go to the Minneapolis YWCA website and click on fitness classes, I find 22 references to yoga, including beginning yoga, uh, middle uh, yoga, youngster yoga, youth and dance yoga, yoga for everybody. He goes on to say, one explanation says that mantra yoga has to do with chanting a word or phrase until you transcend your mind and emotions. It's a process of your super consciousness being discovered and achieved. And that's in a YWCA. Now you've heard that, you know, that, that was an institution started back in the time of Moody as an evangelistic, and most YW and YMCAs uh, are not young. It's mostly older people. The, the W and the M are still pretty much there, but the C is gone. The Christian part, it's an association of usually older uh, men and women. But, but actually, them offering yoga has spiritual overtones because this is what yoga is described as. Now, this is not, what, what I'm reading here is from secular websites, not from Christian, not from the, uh, you know, the Institute of, uh, of Christian Research, CRI, that's always looking for cults and problems. This is just what, what the pagans say about this. Yoga focuses on the harmony between mind and body. Yoga derives its philosophy from Indian metaphysical beliefs. The word yoga comes from Sanskrit and means union or merger. The ultimate aim of this philosophy is to strike a balance between mind and body and attain self-enlightenment. Do you remember what Satan told Eve? He said, if, well, the serpent, but it was Satan, we know from Genesis 12. He says, if you eat that fruit God commanded you not to eat, do you know what will happen? You will become like God and you will know. You will have this enlightenment, this esoteric higher level of knowing stuff. What does yoga do? Uh, yoga helps you attain self-enlightenment. You know, I don't want self-enlightenment. I want God-enlightenment. Yoga is focusing on, on looking within and trying to unleash this and, and, and this, this self-enlightenment from to unite me with the divine whatever out there. Self-enlightenment. To achieve this, continuing the definition of yoga, yoga uses movement, breath, posture, relaxation, and meditation in order to establish a healthy, lively, and balanced approach to life. Now Piper chimes in. You were born again through the living and abiding word of God. This word is the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Don't fall prey to another gospel. There is another gospel, and there is, uh, or, I mean, there is no other gospel, and there is no other path to God, whether it's ultimate well-being or better hearing and understanding or believing, because all of these are scandalous when they deprecate the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is don't get near anything that actually is part of the devil's system, which is what Hinduism is. But that, I just thought you'd think that was interesting that, that Piper weighed in on yoga. But there's a world surrounding us that is swirling with a battle. And that's why Paul said, don't, don't be unaware of what Satan is doing. Don't yield any ground of your life to the devil. Nothing in life is neutral. Did you know that? People love that. They just love the gray area. There is nothing that is neutral. Everything is either for God or against God. Whether, therefore, you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. You know, Paul said nothing's neutral. Even the way we eat can either be for or not for God. Everything that we do is either for or not for his glory. There's nothing neutral. Nothing. You know, some people think, oh, you know, clothing or recreation or this or that. Nothing is neutral. As we'll see in a moment in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And only when we live redemptively does something go from being under his sway 
to being under God's sway. Nothing is neutral. Everything is under the devil's sway in this world except that which we redemptively interact with. And that is something we need to know and understand and live. So, don't ignore the devil. Uh, oh, by the way, I wrote it out for you. There's what Piper said. Be a Christ-exalting, Bible-saturating, discerning person. Uh, don't just sign up for your local yoga class. We already read that. I forgot I typed. No wonder I was late to church. I was typing too much. And I typed that too. There we go. I typed that too. There. Ah, Genesis 3. Let's turn there. I want to show you something, and, and I'm going to come back and do it more deeply, but I just want to give you, as a survey for you to understand this question, Genesis 3. You know, Genesis 1 and 2 is the creation account. Genesis 1 is an uh, anthropological view. That means from man's perspective. Genesis 2 is a cosmological perspective from God's perspective. It's based on the same account from two different angles, kind of like the synoptic gospels. When you get to chapter 3, now we come to the temptation and fall of humanity in chapter 3 with the first statement of the gospel in verse 15. But what I want to focus on are those first five verses because it's very interesting what the devil says. And, and I will show you all this and explain all this, but I'll just show you. The serpent, verse 1, was more cunning than any beast of the field. Why do I say that's the devil? Because it says in Genesis 12, the serpent of old, which is Lucifer, as in Isaiah 14, as in uh, chapter 28 of Ezekiel, it's all the same person. The devil, the serpent, Lucifer, Satan. Same person, it says in, Genesis, or in Revelation 12. So the serpent in this chapter was a real serpent that was being used as a vehicle for the most powerful created being in the universe, the devil himself, Satan, Lucifer, okay? So the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said? The first thing we learn from Satan's strategy is Satan always wants us to question God. Actually, Satan wants us to doubt God's word. Uh, and he uses anything from professors to well-intentioned, teachers uh, that are just trying to expand the minds to uh, a lot of items to make us doubt God's word. So has God really said, doubt God's word, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know what that was? That was an attack on the goodness of God. Does God really think it's, that's a nice fruit. How come God said you're not supposed to? You know, doubt God's goodness. Doubt that God knows what he's doing, that, that his plan is best. Doubt the goodness of God. And that is often what's at the root of so many sins. People think, oh, the Lord isn't good. I don't have a good job. Oh, the Lord isn't good. I don't have a good husband. I don't have a good wife. I don't have this. I don't have enough money. I don't have... The Lord is not good. And so I'm going to take things into my own hands. And I'm going to get what I want. And, and we doubt. And that's part of the Satan's strategy. Doubt God's word. Doubt God's goodness. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it. And then if this has always been questioned by theologians, nor touch it. It could be she's adding to the word of God. There, there might be that the Lord said more than is recorded, but as far as the recorded words, uh, she's doing a little addition there. Uh, Lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you will not surely die. You know what that is? Doubt God's authority. You know what God says? The wages of sin is death. You know what the devil said? No, it's not. And, and what's interesting about, about each of these is that, that these are, are paralleling what we see running throughout all religion, running throughout all the devil's various uh, deceptions. They come to doubting God, doubting he's good, and then right here, doubting his authority, that he is the last word. In fact, the whole idea of reincarnation comes in here. You're not going to die. Nobody dies. You just, you know, you keep going around. You're going up or going down. But you're not going to die. See, it's right back there. The, the, the whole Eastern religion, the, the reincarnationistic idea is, is right there. But keep reading. It says in verse 5, For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. This is that esoteric enlightenment, uh, change of consciousness, you know, knowing more. And you will be like God, 
knowing good and evil. This is doubt God's plan. That wasn't God's plan. He didn't say, eat the fruit and you're going to have this change consciousness and know this and you'll be like God. That wasn't God's plan. He had a different plan for us to be like him. But the devil always has these flaws. And so the first thing, what does God in Genesis 3 say is Satan's strategy? We need to know and understand and be aware of Satan's plan. So God says, watch out. Uh, turn now to John 8, 44, uh, because this is the second verse. Remember, I always attach things in my mind. And, and so if we're looking at the occult and, and these intrusions of the devil, John 8, 44 reminds us of something. When we get saved, whose family do we leave in order to become part of God's family? That's a good question. Remember I said it this morning that you can't, you can't really have a salvation testimony unless you start lost. Well, what, is, what does the Lord say? He says, you, he's talking to, to living, breathing, religious Jewish people in Jerusalem um, in the first century. You are of your father, the devil. The desires of your father you want to do. That explains our fallenness, our sinfulness. We're all infected with that same rebellion. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaks of a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He's a liar and the father of it. That's whose family we were born in. That's why no one has to teach children how to lie. No one has to teach them how to be murderously angry. They're born that way because they're in that family. And that's why the new birth transfers us from the family we were born into into a new family with a new father, with a new operating system from the one that we came into this world with. Uh, well, next, let's go to Ephesians 2 because this is an, another... Uh, kind of like anchor for our hearts and minds, understanding what's going on when we're talking about the, the world of the devil. Ephesians 2, and I want to go through this slowly with you, uh, because what were we saved away from, and what are we saved unto? And uh, basically, uh, oh, I didn't print out the verse, so I'll just, just look at it in your Bibles, and we'll emphasize some things. In Ephesians 2, 1, and you he made alive who were dead. So, so what were we saved from? We were dead in trespasses and sin. Verse 2, in, whom, in which you once walked. So our whole way of life was according to the course of this world. Again, people, we all, when we were born, were wired to follow the course of the world. You've heard of worldliness and world likeness and the world. That is, that is how everyone is wired. Everyone has the same operating system at birth. Everyone is wired to walk, it says there, according to the course of this world. And what does that mean? It's according to the prince of the power of the air. And who might he be? The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Does that include me? Verse 3 among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. This is a universal operating system. I mean, you don't have to go to, to some place where they're doing satanic rituals. That's just one end of the spectrum. Everybody. That's why I, I hear people and they say, well, you know, music is music is music. Music is not neutral. If the music comes from the heart of someone who is, look, look what it says here. We are under the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. If the musician is unregenerated, the very motivations and, and, and words and, and direction of their life comes out because they are walking and conducting themselves. Look what verse 3 says. In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, just as others. So all of us have this commonality with the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now the gospel, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. And he's repeating this dead in trespasses that, that he earlier had said. He made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then the famous verse 8, for by grace you've been saved. Saved from what? From death from living in trespasses and sin, verse 2, from living under the domination, verse 2, of the prince of the power of the air, from verse 3, conducting ourselves according to his desires, his operating system, because he's the God of this world. We've been saved through faith, verse, nine say, or verse 8 says. It's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Verse 9, it's not of works. We didn't dig ourselves out of the pit of sin, lest anyone should boast. But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What were we saved away from? The God of this world. The lust of this world. The operating system of this world. What were we saved unto? Our Heavenly Father. A new operating system. A new orientation, as it says in Colossians 3. We set our affections, our deepest desires, are not tied to things on the earth. When you think about what matters most to you, you can tell your spiritual condition by whether it's totally geared toward here and a house and a lifestyle and a health and wealth and experiences and pleasures or whether your affections are attached to things above, Colossians 3 says. That everyone, every day, can do a little, you know how the, the diabetics are always doing the little, you know, check their, their blood to see their sugar level and all that, you can check your heaven level any day by seeing where affections are primarily. Is, is everything pointed this way? Or is, is it slowly being drawn? We're slowly setting our affection on things above. So, what were we saved away from and unto? Now, next one. Look at First John. We're going to the right. Look at First John 5.19. This is fascinating. And this is one you should have marked if you don't already have it because it explains, it kind of fits the pieces together. What does 1 John 5.19 say is Satan's present role? And if you look at the 19th verse, the Apostle John, remember, he's pastoring in Ephesus. Uh, and, and he is this, is, this is the church that, that Paul founded, that Timothy pastored after Paul. And then, you know, tradition tells us that they killed Timothy and but John is still there, and he's still ministering, kind of like the, the, you know, the chancellor of the church there. And look what he's writing uh, near the end of the canon, 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God. Now look at this. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Nothing's neutral. Either you're of God or you're under the sway of the wicked one. Either you're operating under the sway of the wicked one in that operating system, or you're of God. There's no comfortable in-between. And, and that's the, the underlying for this question about, you know, is this right, is this right, is this right, is this right, is this right? We have to examine the sway, the, verse 19, the sway of the wicked one. How, how much his sway is there and how possible is it to redemptively be involved in that activity for the glory of God? Okay, now let's go to the Old Testament. And the next question is, uh, or the next line of thought is, God has always been opposed to all things occulting. Now, now you might not know what occultic is, and so let me show you. By the way, I, I checked... Um, and, and head toward Deuteronomy 17. We're just going to do several uh, verses in a row. Fifth book, Old Testament, Deuteronomy, starting in uh, chapter 17, Deuteronomy 17, and verses 2 and 3. Now let's define occultic, okay? If there's found among you, Deuteronomy 17, 2, within any of your gates, which the Lord God gives you, a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of the Lord, your God, now that's interesting. We don't determine who's wicked. We don't determine who's bad. It's in God's sight are they wicked. You see, if someone asked me after a couple weeks ago, I was talking about the homosexual, um, you know, that, that whole mess our country's in and, and all the, the direction our country is tilting that way. And they say, 
uh, are homosexuals evil? I say, you mean uh, to me as, as a person? No, they're just people. We work next to them, we ride around, we use their stuff. In fact, a lot of this stuff is from, I mean, if you don't like homosexuality, you ought to stay out of an awful lot of high-tech stuff, okay? Because they're geniuses. But are they evil in the sight of God? Yes. See, that's what matters. It's not my opinion whether I don't like them, I don't like, I'm not comfortable being around them. That is not, we need to get out of that realm. We need to put the attention on, it reminds me, when I pastored for five years at Grace Community Church, the Los Angeles Times, and I've told you this over and over, but I thought, what a monumental thing it was. The Los Angeles Times, owned and operated by pagans, would call area code 818, you know, whatever, I forget the phone, they're not 782, 782-5910, I don't remember the phone number, but they call Grace Community Church. And whenever an issue came up, they would call the switchboard, and they put it through to Pat Rotisky or before her to John's former secretary and say, what does God say about this? They would ask John MacArthur what God said about it. What they meant is, we don't know what the Bible says. Has God weighed in on that issue? Yes or no? And John would tell them. See, that's how we need to project ourselves to the world. Not, I don't like that. It's not nice. It's, you know, it offends me. God says, look at chapter 17. This is what God says is bad. Verse 3. Who has gone and served other gods and worshipped them. So who is someone that is wicked in the sight of God? Anyone that's worshipping another god. Anyone. Buddhist. Confucianist. You know, uh, Shintoist, uh, anybody that's involved in, in any worship of a false deity, even ones they've made up and renamed with Christian names, uh, like Mormonism, has renamed who Jesus Christ is. And he is a lesser created being. And Jehovah's Witnesses have the same problem. That's wicked in God's sight. But that's not all has worshipped either the sun or the moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. God says, I'm not into sun worship, moon worship, or host of heaven worship. What about all these people that follow the zodiac, follow, they, they get their horoscope? What they're doing is they are, worship means that you bow toward, that you, that you come under the sway of, that you yield to. People that are involved in horoscopic or, uh, you know, any of the, the, the mediums that, that tell the future, that guide the spiritual advisors, even these 900 numbers you can call and someone can, you know, tell you your future. The Lord says that is all wickedness. But keep going to chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. Next, in fact, it's on the same page with, in my Bible. I wrote this one out for you. Deuteronomy 18 starting in verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord has, God has given you, this is, this is to the Jews, okay? Now, this is specifically applicable to the Jews, but it has doctrinal implications for us. Don't jettison the Old Testament. Just make sure you understand who the primary intended recipient was and then see if it reveals anything about the character of God because all Scripture, including Deuteronomy 18 and every other verse of the Bible, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And so there is truth about God we can determine and discern from here. And, and he says, when, when you, Israel, are going into that land that I'm giving you, don't, now look at the principle, don't learn to follow. Remember we saw this morning Christianity is following Christ. Don't follow the abominations of those nations. This is what we call paganism. What is paganism? It's everything humanity comes up with apart from God. Leaving God out, not wanting him, uh, substituting something else for him. It's the it's same thing that Romans 1 talks about. All of that, they didn't want to retain God in their minds, so they did their own thing. All of that is paganism. It's the opposite of God, of what he has revealed. There should not be found among you anyone who makes his sons or daughters pass through the fire. That's the, the worship of Moloch and the whole... 
uh, uh, Chemosh and all that stuff, the abomination of the Moabites. Or, now let's talk modern time, one who practices witchcraft. So, I mean, I'm not against, uh, what's her name, uh, Wizard of Oz, girl that hops down the path, um, Dorothy. I'm not against the Wizard of Oz. There are no good witches. There's not a good witch of the East. There's, there's nothing good in witchcraft. Nothing. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter if you can sing really nicely and you have it snowing and it's frozen or whatever that's called. If it's witchcraft, it's not good. It doesn't matter if the music is catchy. It doesn't matter if every kid in the church can sing it. Anything to do with witchcraft, God is opposed to. God hates. God does not want us to, to have anything to do to learn the abominations of witchcraft. There is not good witchcraft. Witches that help people are not good. They're witches. You understand that? There are witches and warlocks. It's, none of it's good in any form. Or a soothsayer, someone that can help you get guidance uh, from the powers, the energy, from uh, the, the other side. Or one who interprets omens. Or a sorcerer, someone who is into uh, incantations and spells and all of that, who conjures spells. Or a medium. A medium is a go-between, the spirit world in here. And they communicate. They, they, they're the ones that... that have the seances and, and they talk to people. Or a spiritist, someone who deals with the spirits, or one who calls up the dead. Do you remember um, in uh, 1 Samuel 30 when Saul goes to Endor and talks to the witch there and she is used to this, she's a medium and she knows the demons. And by the way, demons know far more than Google. You understand that? They are intelligent spirits. They've, they've been alive the entire time of the human race. So they've all existed as long as all humans have existed throughout all of history since creation. They've been around. And they can hear, they can see, they travel. You learn something on a trip, how would you like to be on a trip for thousands of years and speak every language and not forget anything? Can you imagine? So demons know stuff that it's impossible for humans to know. And they can trick humans, because they know the past, they know where everything's buried. You wanna know where the buried treasures are? The demons know. They watched it, they watched the pirates bury it, they watched everybody, they saw all these people go out and put the can in their backyard by the tree that grew around it, it's in the roots of the tree, all those gold coins, they know right where they are. And they will lead people. They'll do anything they can to get people under their influence. And so this woman was, was, she in 1 Samuel 30, the witch at Endor, was able to get demons to tell people what they wanted to hear because you could find out. They knew where the soldiers were hiding. They knew what the plans were. They were there when the king was talking about his plans. And so they're the ultimate NSA. You know what I mean? They knew what's going on everywhere. And they can go through walls. There, there's no, nothing that is pervious to them. They are, they're able to go through. And so she was used to working with them. So Saul comes, and she's, when she realizes who it is, scares her. And she says, what have you done? He says, I want Samuel. So she went and did her normal thing. And when she conjured up, it wasn't the demons that usually came and impersonated people and talked to the paying customer. And she screamed because it was really Samuel. She'd never had anybody come up from the grave because people can't come up from the grave. You can't communicate with your dead relative through a medium because they are in a place where there's a great gulf, Jesus said, and no one can go from here to there and no one can go from there up to us. So she was shocked. It was her first time having a true, you know, bringing someone back. And she screamed. So stay away from mediums and spiritists and those that call up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination of the Lord. Now, you want to know something about the immutability of God? If something was an abomination to God, it still is. You understand that? 
God wants us and all people of all time that have anything to do with him to have nothing to do, to stay as far away as we can from witchcraft, sorcery, mediums, omens, spells, calling up the dead. It's an abomination. And because of these, the Lord is going to drive them out before you and you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. The Lord says, I want you to to keep clear and clean of all that stuff. And don't be drawn under the sway of the evil one. Well, keep going. Uh, let's, in your Bibles, if you want to look to 1 Chronicles, uh, I'll show you what happened to Saul. 1 Chronicles 10 has an interesting word from the Lord. So you're in Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st Chronicles. So if you keep going to the right, you'll get there. In chapter 10, and it says this, 1 Chronicles 10, verse 13. Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, also because he consulted a medium for guidance. And God says, I don't want anything to do with you, Saul. That, I mean, he did a lot of other bad stuff. But what did the Lord say? You didn't, you didn't want to follow me. Instead, you consulted a medium for guidance. Uh, Isaiah 8, I'll just read it to you. Isaiah 8 and verse 19. Seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Uh, and they seek the dead on behalf of the living. And the Lord says, that's bad. Okay, uh, how about this one? Let's go to uh, Acts 13. Okay, this is a good one to write down. Now we're in the New Testament. A lot of people get real uncomfortable in the Old Testament because they're just not sure about it. Well, this is in the New Testament, okay? Look at Acts 13. Paul is plowing along in his first missionary journey, and Elymas, the sorcerer, this is just the New King James text, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul. This is a high-ranking uh, Roman uh, political figure that Paul was ministering to, away from the faith, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Elymas, the sorcerer, and said, and here, here is, here is a New Testament perspective on anything involved with the occult, with, with the one in, who has sway over everything on this planet, the devil. The, the people that are in tune with him are sorcerers, mediums, involved in witchcraft, and all those other words that were in Deuteronomy. And this is one of them. And this is how Paul defines them. O full of all deceit, all fraud, you son of the devil, you are of your father the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Did you know what is going on in our culture is we're gradually, in American culture, as we're pulling out the control rods of the gospel, of the word of God, of prayer, of, of Christians being salt and light, as we're pulling that out, our culture is descending into paganism. And paganism is an enemy of all righteousness. Because righteousness, uh, as one philosopher puts it, our modern relativistic world has their feet firmly planted in midair. That means we're standing on nothing. We have no foundation, no moral compass, no source of right and wrong and truth. And, and Satan is an enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Do you know, if you want to really criticize someone, you say, you're really straight-laced, aren't you? Did you know God considers his plan for us to be straight ways? Well, it's time for communion. So what do you do with any, any occultic influence? And we're going to get to Genesis 3, but it was too big to, to go through all of the elements of it because there's a lot of implications of it. But look what happens because Paul keeps plowing. He gets to Ephesus and many came believe and came confessing and telling their deeds. They had the, this lives turned upside down and, and regenerated. Also many of those who had, before their salvation, who had, you notice that when they came to Christ, their allegiance, no longer could they be involved in the occult because they belonged to Christ. But they had been, in the old days, actually not just normal sinners, they had been 
soldiers for the devil himself. They had practiced magic. Now, if you talk to Disney, magic is, it's magical. You know, I, I think the Walt Disney Company is the largest purveyor of satanic stuff. It just looks pretty and sounds pretty, but it's occultic. Because either it's God's power or it's not. And if it's not God, then 1 John 5, 19 says it's under the sway of the devil. Now, I'm not opposed. I have a dear, beloved brother in Christ that I mentored who is one of the executives of Disney. And, you know, he always asked me, should I get out of here? I said, no. You know, it'd be like leaving the world. But don't be falsely duped into thinking if the song is pretty and the characters have pretty smiles that it's okay. It's kind of like the title of that recent movie maleficient or whatever whatever it was that's what it is practice magic but what do believers do they bring anything together that has to do with the occult and they burn them in the sight of all they don't sell them on ebay they get rid of them anything to do with the devil games books you know uh the crystal balls the the seance the ouija boards all of that stuff is to be destroyed and that's, in fact, any holy hardware that's involved with idolatry. The Lord says, get rid of it. Well, when we come back next time, uh, next Sunday night, I'm all ready for you. Satan's four lies. And we're going to go through and see what each one of them mean and how we see them tracing through. And we'll get to yoga. Okay? But let's bow for a word of prayer. And as we bow, I invite the elders and deacons to come and uh, prepare to serve us our celebration of the Lord's table. Father in heaven, we bow before you. And as the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, we can't partake in the cup of blessing and the cup of demons. Those two are mutually exclusive. You only want us to come to your table if we have renounced all the hidden things of darkness. And so I pray right now that your spirit would stir hearts. And if there's any uncleanness of evil, of darkness, of the occult, that through uh, games or through media, through music, through curiosity has gotten into, your spirit is grieved and quenched because all of those things are abominable to you, infinite holy God. And I pray that we would come before you tonight with clean hands. And that's possible because if we will confess and forsake anything, we have mercy from you instantaneously. And so I pray that all of us would make sure we have clean hands and pure hearts for holding these beautiful pictures of your body and of your blood. Thank you for this bread. Thank you for giving yourself for us. Thank you that we can hope and place our trust in you, O oh Lord, who gave yourself for me. Bless our worship tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.